Happy Friday evening, everyone. Welcome to the first Royal Society of Literature and British Library event of 2021, and my first as chair of the RSL. Becoming chair of the RSL is the greatest professional honour of my life. I look forward to continuing our work in celebrating the, the diversity and wealth of classic and contemporary literature. Literature continues to find new readers and new authors from underrepresented backgrounds. The RSL has an important role in all of this, in safeguarding and broadening literature's contribution to our lives. We're pleased that so many of you could be here this evening, and we're grateful that you continue to support great writing in these challenging times. There'll be a Q&A to round up the evening, and you'll find the chat function by scrolling down on your browser. Since we cannot see you, it will be lovely to hear from you. So do send in your comments and questions. That way we can keep our two RSL fellows, Mark Lawson and Hermione Lee, on their toes as they discuss Hermione's biography of Tom Stoppard. I'm going to briefly introduce Mark before he introduces Hermione. Mark Lawson was elected Fellow of the Royal Society of Literature in 2015. I'm sure we're all familiar with his important contribution to the arts on television, radio and in print. He has interviewed just about every major contemporary literary figure. Mark is also a novelist and dramatist, and his works have featured fictionalised accounts of historical figures such as, and I'm going to do a little list here, Margaret Thatcher, JFK, Marilyn Monroe, Harold Macmillan, and if that wasn't enough, Graham Greene and a bit of Evelyn Waugh mixed in there. What a list, Mark. Well done. And on a personal note, I've had the pleasure of working with Mark on several occasions and I've always been struck by his kindness and curiosity and his open-minded approach to the arts. So I can think of no finer person to interview Hermione about her biography. Over now to Mark Lawson. Mark Lawson, do you receive me? I do. It is like the Mars landing, isn't it, this morning? And equally successful, we hope. Thank you very much, Dalgic. Congratulations on becoming chair. An excellent choice. Um, thank you for those kind words. And yes, I will be talking to uh, Dame Hermione Lee about Tom Stoppard, A Life, her extraordinary, magnificent biography of uh, our greatest living playwright, we would probably agree. As Dalgic said, I'll um, talk to Hermione for a while uh, from our different studies. We have to get all these books rushed in uh, to make us both look literary. Um, and then there'll be questions uh, from you, which I'll be able to read out. We welcome most questions. The only one, because it's obviously tempting, and I was going to ask it, is uh, who Hermione might like to go on to write biographies about, but she's keeping that very quiet for the moment, so it would be a wasted question from me or from you. It isn't Boris Johnson, uh, it isn't Donald Trump, um, and she's not going to tell us tonight. However, we will discuss in uh, some detail her life of Tom Stoppard, in which she follows his work from a work that even the most dedicated Stoppardians may only be slightly familiar with, which was A Walk on the Water, a TV play he wrote in 1963, which uh, later became a stage play, Enter a Free Man, right up to Leopoldstadt in 2020, which anyone who walks around the London West End on their daily permitted act of exercise will notice the poignancy right through the West End, but particularly when you go past the theatre and you see Leopoldstadt effectively suspended, uh, waiting for the return of theatre, but the producers um, are determined that it will return and anyone who's seen it or had tickets or read about it will look forward to that. So, Welcome to Dame Hermione Lee. And um, where I thought I'd like to start, Hermione, it seemed to me that um, almost in the way that divers have degrees of difficulty if you dive in the Olympics, um, you've worked through, it, through your biographies across really all of the different dilemmas and difficulties. So you've written about the American writers, uh, Willa Cather, and Edith Wharton, um, Virginia Woolf, a great English figure, where they had been dead for some decades. Then you wrote about Penelope Fitzgerald, um, who had died relatively recently and had living relatives, so you had to negotiate that issue. 
And now for the first time with Tom Stoppard, you've dealt with a living uh, subject. So I thought we'd start there with the different um, uh, challenges um, presented by those subjects um, and whether you have deliberately set yourself different challenges. Thank you. The first thing I want to say is it's extremely nice to be talking to you since actually you are the world's greatest living expert on Tom Stoppard, as we are rapidly going to discover. Um, yes, of course, the question of the, the safely dead subject and the living subject is one that's been very much uh, on, on my mind. Um, and when Stoppard asked me to, to, to do this book um, in 20, end of 2013, um, of course, it was an amazing adventure and challenge to be asked, and I, you know, nobody would have said no. But I did think this is going. This could be very problematic. Um, actually, because he's a generous and professional person, um, it wasn't as problematic as it might have been. Um, I, uh, Beckett famously said to his biographer, "I will neither help nor hinder." Uh, and Stoppard didn't hinder, but he did also help. So he promised, for instance, to make materials available to me. So what the biographer of a living subject has, uh, if the subject is willing, is access to that subject, which took the form of long conversations, sometimes over several days, um, over a period of years, in which really there were no, there was nothing barred. I mean, there were things he was you know, obviously a bit bored with answering and things that fired him up, like when I asked him what he was wearing in the 1970s. There's <laughs> an amazing riff about ruffles and Mr. <laughs> Fish shoes and so on. Um, so quite unexpected moments in these conversations. Um, you have access to the materials that the person is willing to show you, as well as what is a considerable archive for him in, in the Harry Ransom Centre in Texas, where it's all perfectly catalogued. There are many, many versions of the plays. And you can see the drafts there, which is, of course, fascinating in itself. Um, so one of the things I was able to see, which I probably wouldn't have been able to see if he'd not been with us, are the letters that he wrote to his mother from about 1948 till she died in 1996. He wrote her a letter every week, whether or not they had phone calls. And these letters are a kind of diary of what he's doing. He clearly doesn't want her to feel out of touch with him. Uh, and although he doesn't tell her everything he's writing to his mother, um, it's an astonishing um, entry point into his life. They were all pretty much all undated. So I had to date them before I could use them. But that was a remarkable thing. The other thing, of course, is you get to talk to a lot of people who know him. And this is a person who knows a million people. So I had to take a sort of representative slice in the theatre and media and literary world of people who know him and also family and friends and so on. And the, that, that raises the problem of the living person, which is that although um, people want to help you because, because of him, they want to help you because they want to do well by him, they are also extremely aware that he's probably going to be reading what they are saying about him, <laughs> if I put it in the book. And so I, I think I had to be aware of that. I had to have a pinch of salt with me. And I also remember when um, Tom Stoppard received the David Cohen Prize, I was chair of the judges, and he, he said he was, um, he felt slightly miffed, one of his favourite words, I think, that uh, it was a Lifetime Achievement Award and he was still living. <laughs> I mean, that, that, that would apply even more to um, uh, a biographer because, you know, famously, the, we take the meaning of a work of art, I mean, fiction, particularly drama, from its ending. And yes. you're seeing a story that hasn't got an ending. Yes. Well, luckily, I like unfinished pictures. And there's a line in Indian Ink where the poet says to the painter, you know, unfinished pictures are the best. Um, because they still because they have life in them. So I like the idea anyway of biography which leaves gaps and silences and mysteries and unsolved problems because that's what life is and that's how you know other people. Um, with him, it's a particular um, uh, this this business about lifetimes achievement and being honoured and all the rest of it and being put in various kinds of boxes is all the more acute for the biographer because he's been very rude about biography. Mm -hmm. Uh, not him personally, but his characters uh, in a lot of the plays. And there's a wonderful moment in Indian Ink where the old lady says to the would-be biographer, or biography is the worst excuse for getting people wrong. Mm -hmm. um, 
and I did. I was on a. I've done a few public interviews with with Stockard over the last few years, and we were on a platform together at the Ninety Second Street Y in in New York. And I, I like you, I had my questions ready, uh, and I, I I'd asked the first question, and he turned the audience and says, "Before I answer this question, you know the author who says." Biography adds a new terror to death. Well, here she is. Um, <laughs> and then we went on from there. So there is a slight edge to the whole process of being biographified. And I, my feeling is that as time went on, because it takes a long time to write such a book, uh, I think he got more used to the idea that he had a biographer. But you talked about, which um, I totally accept and understand, the people talking about him, worrying about him reading it. You had a much greater problem, which is the, fir the first time in your biographical career you had the subject reading yes. it. I mean, that must have been a nerve-wracking moment when you sent it off. Well, he, he, we sat side by side for several hours while he went through this large typescript, having marked it up copiously with yellow post-it notes. And it was somewhat... Uh, taxing because I didn't quite know what was going to happen. What struck me about it was that he was very philosophical about the whole thing um, and things that I thought he might balk at, he didn't. So just to give you an example, there's a very touching, very early romantic love relationship with a girl in Bristol. Um, and he wrote her some pretty soppy poems and letters when he was in his E. Cummings phase, so there aren't any capital letters uh, in these letters. And I think they're very sweet and touching, and he's 18 years old um, or 19 years old. And I thought he might think this is too embarrassing for words, and I think he decided just that it's part of the story. What The only thing he asked me to take out uh, was a reference to an actor who had been sacked from a revival of one of his plays. And he, he didn't ask me to take the fact out. He said, do you have to name him? And I thought that was, um, I was impressed by that. I thought that was generous and admirable, actually, that that was the one thing he asked me to censor. And to give a sense, I'm going to tell a little story now about the level of your um, research. Uh, a couple of years ago, I took a, a little parcel into um, a post office in London. And for security reasons, they now ask you what's in it. And they're very impressed because Hermione, people know, has a wide variety of titles, and I tend to use all of them. So I'd written, I'd written on the package, <laughs> Dame Professor President Hermione Lee, Hermione Lee, FRSL, all the rest of it. And That's the, why they never reach me. Hey, and, they, <laughs> and the person in the post office looked at it, the assistant, and obviously thought it must contain the crown jewels or state secrets or something, because this person is so elevated. So they said, can I ask you what's in it? And I said, yes. I said, yes, there's a DVD of an obscure English sex comedy called, yes. <laughs> called Don't Just Lie There, Say Something. That's and right. There's, there's a playtext of No Sex Please Were British. Yes. Now, can I explain that to the audience before they get the wrong idea? Um, so you are not only the world's greatest living expert on Tom Stoppard, amongst a few others, but you're also the world's greatest living expert on, on the history of the Whitehall farces in, uh, in English theatre. Um, and this wasn't one of my fortes when I started the book, but there is a very funny, rather silly uh, play by Stoppard called Dirty Linen, uh, which is actually about press freedom. Uh, and it's about whether the, the obnoxiousness of a free press is worth the candle. And this is actually a subject that he's returned to in more serious form in, a, in, in for instance, a play called Night and Day. Um, but I was doing my homework uh, because I wanted to set it in its context as a sort of Brian Ricks uh, type play, which he had obviously looked at uh, and thought, these plays make a lot of money. These plays are very successful, these white hall farces. And so he was doing a sort of spoof. And, yeah. and the joke for him was to set a white hall farce in white hall. White hall. But also... So thanks for the books, Mark. Yeah, but financially it, it worked because it, it ran for years, didn't it? There's yes, a indeed. In London. Yeah. Yeah. There was a point where he had something like four plays running in London at the same time. I mean, he's often had that thing of having two plays on at different theatres or two plays on at the Lincoln Centre at the same time. He is astonishingly successful 
um, in a way, in a sort of way that no other playwright of his time quite has been, I think, in, in becoming a kind of household film. I think Pinter is the only equivalent, really. But the, the reason I the reason I mentioned those sources uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, one is that which you cover uh, very strongly in the book. Um, he isn't a, a literary or theatrical snob at all. I mean, he there's also one of the I think one of the great greatest one act plays, which is the Red Inspector Hound, which is a parody of Agatha Christie. Yes. So when um, uh, Red Inspector Hound was on, and when um, uh, Dirty Linen was on. He has parodies of two West End forms going on yes. at the um, yes. at the same time, and it is. But also the other thing, which you also cover, is and he said this himself. He self-deprecatingly says he can't think of plots. Um, almost all the works have another text behind them. Most um, famously in um, the importance of being earnest behind travesties and so or on. Hamlet. Yeah, it, yeah. <laughs> yes, in, yeah, well, in, there in, are a couple. Yeah. There are a couple of things there, Mark. That, uh, um, uh, that are very interesting. It's true that he often uses another story um, or the story of Joyce and Tsar and Lenin all together in, in um, Trieste at that time, uh, or, he, or the story of the Russian revolutionaries in Coast of Utopia. He is provoked and inspired uh, um, by other stories. Uh, yes, and I forgot what we were talking about before, because you went on to that. You had another question um, well, it's, about, it's about him not being. Um, uh, oh yes, the the popular. Yeah, sure. That's a really uh, that's a really important point to make because <laughs> that's a wonderful moment where he says, um, "He's gone on call my bluff with Miriam Stoppard, his then wife," and he says, "I'm sure Samuel Beckett never went on call my bluff," uh, and you can. See, he likes things like the Monty Python show and, and uh, he likes things Morecambe like Just Wise. a Minute, um, Morecambe and Wise, all those comedies. Um, uh, he likes rock music um, and rock music has been incredibly important to him. He doesn't particularly like opera. Uh, so in some ways he's, he, he loves popular culture, but in other ways, of course, this is someone who is thinking extremely hard about Wittgenstein or about Greek poetry. Uh, or about quantum physics or about consciousness theory. So what you've got very unusually are plays made up of a remarkable stretch of knowledge and curiosity and interest. And I think if you were to ask me, you know, what are the, what are the key things that make him so, so great and so important and uh, um, the word important is a bit stuffy, but so, um, so meaningful to people is this mixture of language, knowledge and feeling. I think it's those three things in gear together which make him so remarkable. Now, the feeling thing, I was going to pick up on that because there is um, a critical libel, which is still pursued by a couple of critics, actually, which is that um, it was all brain, his plays are all brain and no heart. There is no feeling. I've always found that astonishing because um, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. Dead is the key word in that um, title. Mm -hmm. It's about death and uh, despair, and you feel it in good productions. But he's always suffered from that every so often, and sometimes the same critic would announce, finally, Mr Stoppard has shown yes. us his heart. Yes, it's, it keeps on happening, doesn't it? You'll, you'll recognise it in waves of criticism. Um, people thought that Rosencrantz and Jumpers and Travesties was just all hijinks and fizz and dazzlingness. And then they thought with um, the real thing, oh, he's finally found a heart. And then again with Arcadia, you get, you know, 10 years on, you get the same kind of thing. And even now with Leopoldstadt, you've got a few critics saying, oh, good heavens, Tom Stoppard <laughs> is a serious and moving playwright. But you're quite right. You're quite right about that. Um, there's a play. There's a playwright he very much liked and knew called James Saunders, who I think is not very well known now. Next time I'll sing to you. There I was think. a play called Next Time I'll Sing to You, which had a, had a great, which was kind of surreal, odd postmodernist play, and it has a, a line in it. Um, there lies behind everything a certain quality which we may call grief, and it's very extraordinary to see that line coming through Stoppard's life because there was a television program he made, a sort of spoof documentary about himself in 1972 called Tom Stoppard Doesn't Know. And it was about 
not being able to make up your mind on every question of the day. And it was about moving around in uncertainties and not making your mind up and having sort of negative capability, as it were, as a writer. Um, and you still see that coming through in someone like the character of Turgenev in Coast of, Coast of Utopia, where Turgenev, as it were, prides himself on taking every possible point of view. Um, now, Stoppard is a man with strong principles and morality, but he's still... He's a playwright, so he's able to speak in different voices, so he can do the different people. But that that line about grief underlying everything, that line from James Saunders, comes into that early television programme. And then I heard him quote it again at a lecture in Oxford about five years ago. So it stayed with him, and I think that sense of underlying grief. People in his people in his plays, even from Rosencrantz, all that history comes at them. They turn up, they don't know why they're there, they don't know whether they can get home again. They're often in exile, they can barely remember their own name. They're not, they may have been wrongfully incarcerated. They may have some terrible moral dilemma that they don't know how to solve. They may have lost someone. And over and over again, I think you get that sense of, of loss and longing in these very funny, witty plays. And that's what appeals to me. That's what I find so, so remarkable about him. And an earlier um, biography, which he claims never to have read, called um, Double, uh, Double Life? Yes, Double Lives, I think, by, yeah. By Ira Nadell, an um, yes. American writer. Um, he, 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 he writes uh, there about doubling in uh, Stoppard himself in his plays. Um, and it's an extraordinary thing because he has had two names, two identities. He insisted for a long time that he... I mean, had no physical memory of growing up, of being in Czechoslovakia or much of India. But um, it seemed to me reading your book that it is as if the later plays more and more of Tomas Strausler comes through. Yes. Plays. Um, I mean, it was a perfectly good premise, I think, to, to call that that earlier biography uh, double lives. I'm, I'm a little leery myself of doing that, that, sort of thematizing of a life before you've actually read it. So I've never had subtitles or second titles for my books because I really just want to see where that person takes me and where that life takes me. Um, but certainly there is a lot of doubling uh, going on and you have plenty of twins and, you know, double acts going on in the plays. Um, the fact that, uh, as he put it to me, or find my life was very exciting up to the age of eight uh, the, the <laughs> fact that he has that extraordinary past life of growing up in Zlin in what was then Czechoslovakia, with his father a Jewish doctor, having to leave when the Nazis came, going to Singapore when the Japanese invaded and his father was killed and his mother taking her two little boys, not really knowing where they were going in all the terror of the, the you know, chaos of everything, ending up in the... Um, in Darjeeling, where she works um, for the Butter shoe firm, which had been um, the centre of Zlin, and his father worked in the Butter hospital. Um, and from the time he was in India, certainly, um, he was uh, speaking English all the time at school. And then his mother married Ken Stoppard, an English major, and got her family, got her children to safety in England. And so Tom, as he put it, put on Englishness like a coat when he arrived in England. And in a sense that there's, because his mother then absolutely determinedly assimilated and was afraid of anti-Semitism in England and didn't want uh, her English husband to be dogged by her past, absolutely put her past behind her. I mean, it's not uncommon in that generation. It's not uncommon in people who have lived through such experiences of exile and of loss. But the fact that several members of her close family were killed in the Holocaust was not something that Chopard found out about until he was in his 50s. And it was not something that he began to write about until very late on. And even then, although you're saying that Thomas Strassler his, his childhood name comes into the picture more and more in his later work. He still doesn't make it directly autobiographical. I mean, the family in Leopoldstadt is a is a Viennese is a middle class wealthy Viennese um, family. It's not a it's not a doctor's family from Zlin. So he keeps that. Distance. Although one of the, 
one of the advantages you have, as you say, is seeing all the drafts in the uh, library and the archive. Um, he did come close to writing very uh, directly about himself in the, the play that became Rock and Roll. At one point was going to be what would have happened if Tom Thomas mm. had stayed um, in Czechoslovakia. Yes, the main character, Jan, was in, in the drafts. You can see he's called Thomas. Mm. Uh, as, as Stoppa said, which I suppose is still my name in a tone of slight <laughs> bewilderment and not being quite sure. Yes, and clearly the political alternative to go to England, to find yourself in a free country, to have not gone back to Czechoslovakia as it then was and live under communist repression, to be f- able to speak freely and write freely, unlike the, the person who perhaps is his most central uh, alter ego in his life, Václav Havel, um, whose cause and, and the cause of Charter 77 and of political prisoners and Soviet Jewish refuseniks and so on, uh, Stoppard became hugely involved with in, in the 70s, as he did with the Belarus um, theatre people um, in the 2000s. So his own, what he has for a long time called his luck, his chance, the throw of the dice, the throw of the coin that has meant he has been part of this free country, which for a long time he idealized, I think, and, and even romanticized as the land of the free, um, uh, which made him, you know, naturally tending towards a sort of conservative allegiance, particularly in the 1980s, naturally tending against the the work of the press unions, for instance, which made him, I think, very unpopular in left-wing literary and theatrical circles for a while, though I think he's become far more sort of left-wing, as if that's the right word, um, uh, as, as time has gone on. But that idea that what matters more than anything else is true free language and um, being able to have a kind of moral equilibrium that is not repressed or suppressed by a totalitarian regime or a totalitarian utopianism of any kind. That's right at the heart of this work. And we have to be careful of plot spoiling because sadly, uh, few, so few people so far have seen Leopold Staff, but we strongly hope they will um, in due course. But there's another scene in that that I'll allude to, which again, and it struck me as an extraordinary sort of self-portrait in which in one scene you have a character from the family where people have died in the Holocaust, have suffered um, genocide and oppression and prejudice, who has grown up in England in a rather cavalier way about it all. And I, I, I've rarely felt such a sense of a writer, uh, as such a self-critical scene. Yes, I think we can talk about it because the, the play, after all, is in print, mm. um, so, so people can read it. Um, and, it, it, I mean, without going into too much detail, the young man who comes to Vienna and finds the, the two living, surviving members of, of what was a very large family, most of whom have been killed um, in, in the Holocaust or whose lives have been completely wrecked. Uh, and he got away as a baby and uh, his mother has done what? Papa's mother did, which is to not talk about it. His mother's died in the in the play, and he comes back and he's rather blithe. He's rather smug. He's rather casual. He doesn't understand what's happened. And w- one of these two characters, who are giving him the lesson of his past, say to him, "Nobody's life begins at the age of eight. And when I was talking to Stoppard about this play, he said. Uh, the whole play was written in order for that line to be to be spoken on stage. No, it's extraordinary. And when I am, um, uh, as you acknowledge, interviewed him several times over the years, yes, and you did. there was it's almost very, an, very revealingly too. He yeah, said more to you than he said to most people. No, no, but there, there was an apology in effect later on because I'd been um, banging away, boring away for years about the fact Czechos- Czechoslovakia, Judaism. Um, you've had two lives and he always always knocked it back and then only after his mother's death did he in effect apologize and say look I couldn't talk about all that when my mother was alive because she just didn't want me to. One of the things you see in the letters to his mother which are enormously touching and interesting um, uh, uh, is 
a, a kind of ongoing argument with her about his political activities. When he's defending, uh, he's really standing out and defending Soviet jury, Soviet refuseniks, um, and running big protests on the steps of the National Gallery and getting big international support um, uh, for these people. And she is worried for him. She's very worried that somehow uh, things will turn against him and he will be in some way punished for this. It will be somehow dangerous to him. And you find him writing to her and saying, you know, look, I, I need to do this. Why should I live my single privileged safe life? And I'm sorry it upsets you, but this is something that I feel I, I need to do. And I don't really think I am in danger. Other people are in danger. That's what this is about. Uh, so there clearly was a kind of, I would struggle is too strong a word because they obviously got on extremely well and loved each other, but um, there was clearly a, a tension there. And I think that, that yes, after she died, um, he did feel, I think, that he was now able to speak and think. And of course he went back to having, you know, he went back to India, he went back to Zlin, he went back to Prague, you know, he, he revisited quite a lot uh, at that point in the 90s and wrote about, wrote a piece um, at the time, uh, which was about a, partly about a meeting with a cousin who uh, he hadn't really known, who told him the family story. She sort of drew the family tree for him on the back of a napkin in the middle of a rehearsal of the National Theatre. And he says to her, uh, were we Jewish? It's an astonishing question for a man in his 50s. And she says, yes, of course you were Jewish. Um, and then she tells him where everybody died, what happened to her. And that conversation, which is in that article, uh, which was in a magazine called Talk, um, and it was called you know, by him called uh, on, on turning out to be on turning out to be Jewish. That was the title they gave it. That very conversation is replicated in Leopold stuff. And one of the we talked about the doublings. Um, one of them, which the critic Kenneth Tynan made much of in a profile, that it I thought of it when you were talking about his sense of why he had to be politically engaged was that you have Stoppard and Havel, who, as you say, were friends. And Havel, in a different sense, had a charmed life, but it was terrible for a long time. And then he became president <laughs> of his country. And he, he does seem, and in, I think, one of the great television plays, Professional Foul, uh, which is set in Poland, because he, as you say, he tends to do that slight distancing. Mm -hmm. um, but you do, you have a profound sense there of, his luck in being Tom Stoppard rather than Vaslev Havel or any of the other uh, dissidents who were... Can I, can I read a letter yeah. that he wrote to Havel? Sorry, I hadn't thought about doing this, although I think I can... I think I can find it. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, while you find out, just say, say, do send your questions in, because we're moving towards oh, okay. the second half of this now. But, um, so... How long, can I read for two minutes? Could I read this for two minutes? Yeah. So it's about it's about what you've been talking about. It's 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 Tom Tom's support of Václav Havel through the seventies and eighties when he's constantly either in prison or under surveillance um, before the Velvet um, uh, Revolution. Um, and Stoppard has done by then a translation of Lago Desolato, uh, Havel's play. Um, in 1984, Havel was out of jail but under surveillance. He had no passport and could not leave the country. Stoppard, at his request, went to the University of Toulouse to accept an honorary doctorate on his behalf. He read Havel's speech for him, which was published as Politics and Conscience. It set Havel's speech set impersonal systems of totalitarian power against the natural world and the humanity of individuals and recommended what Havel called anti-political politics politics as practical morality, as service to the truth, as essentially humanly measured care for our fellow humans. Stoppard read the speech and made some comments which he jotted down in note form. The last note was, and this is very typical of Stoppard, all political questions are moral questions. Back home in England, a few weeks after this trip, he wrote to him, Stoppard wrote to Havel, I'm feeling rather conscious of you today for a very peculiar reason. I dreamt last night that I had been sent to jail, I don't know why, for three years. My dream was about my first day in jail. I was in a terrible despair about being there, and in my dream, hoped it was only a dream, but knew it wasn't. 
Then one of my children woke me up when he was going to school. And after the first moment of relief that I wasn't in jail, but merely in bed, I immediately thought of you and how frightful it must have been when there was no possibility of waking up and finding yourself at home. Isn't that a strange? Yeah. Mm. Uh, no, that's an amazing letter. Um, I say we're moving towards the questions and we've got some okay. um, interesting ones here, but um, a couple more things I was going to talk about. We made the point that this is um, the first time in your uh, major biographies you've written about a, um, a living person, but also um, when you've written previously about novelists, um, essentially you are, your two sources are the text and the life and then you can do whatever you want with them, and you have, yeah, there are a variety of things you can do. In this case, there's a third factor, which is the... Several more factors. Yeah, but the production life of the play. Yeah, a sure. stop himself, that, you know, a text is... A, a theatre text is a template for something else. Yes, theatre is an event, not a text. Yeah. Mm. Yes. Uh, he often says, well, this is, this is one of the big challenges uh, it, partly it's to do with the fact that this is not just generic this is a particular person of extraordinary energies and concentration when he really gets going so that you really want your writing to be like a musical stage so you can do sort of six things at once on one line because he's he's writing a play thinking about another He's rehearsing a previous production. He's involved in casting. He's maybe doing a film script. He might be doing some radio. He's probably giving a couple of lectures. He's also got a big social life and a family life going on at the same time. So it's quite breathtaking, the amount of energy that streams through this life and which I tried to put into the, into the book. But also, yes, he doesn't leave his plays alone. Once they're out there, as you well know, um, he follows them. He doesn't go to every rehearsal of every production of Rosencrantz he couldn't possibly but when there is a major revival either here or in the states um uh, he will you, he will try and go and he will try and as he puts it look after my play uh and make sure that you know terrible things aren't being done to it but the other remarkable thing I had the very good luck to sit in rehearsal and watch him with two new plays um Hard Problem and Leopold Start and two revivals the Marble Travesties and the Laveau um 50th anniversary production of Rosencrantz and in in the case of the revivals of these classic plays he's doing some tweaking you know 50 years on he's on <laughs> extraordinary sight to see this cast of actors for Rosencrantz, most of whom hadn't been born when Rosencrantz was put first put on at the Old Vic, including Daniel Radcliffe, you know, sort of wide-eyed and watching Stoppard saying, why don't we put another line for Gertrude in here? <laughs> but this plays in print, it's taught, it's, it's an A-level text. You know? <laughs> but for him, it's not a sacrosanct, not a sacrosanct. It's a, it's a movable feast, if you like. It's something to quote one of his, you know, favorite authors. It's it's something that can be uh, can be gone back to and moved. And he was very willing. Well, not not entirely willing, but quite willing with Patrick Harbour's production of Travesty to introduce some quite silly new gags. Um, yes. It did make their way into the into the revised uh, edition of the of the play. So it's a very fascinating and extraordinary thing to watch this person at work on his own work, where the thing that's happened in his mind, where every word counts and every phrase is perfect and every piece of language is wrung out as perfectly as possible. And then when he gets in the room with all these people, which he loves, um, he'll change things and he'll add things and he'll, and he'll order things. He said, I once put in a new line so that because someone didn't have time to get from the bed to the door, um, so he's a pragmatist. Uh, he'll put in things or he'll, he'll tweak things for pragmatic reasons, but he doesn't want other people to do the tweaking. But also, as interesting <laughs> for you as a biographer and critic, that you had to deal with this new uh, aspect that if you were writing about Edith Wharton um, or Virginia Woolf, the text is the text that all the time. Not entirely. Well, yes, that's a that's a very complicated, interesting point. We got another hour on that, but they have but you have to do the short version. Oh, well, some writers there's, there's, do, do revise there's, their, their there's books. Agree, though, there's more. Uh, no, sure. There are more variables in theatre. I sometimes, as a critic, I go to see 
the same production two or three times because you take friends or yes. family, you it transfers. And it's always astonishing to me that there could be 10 minutes difference in the length yes. of the play. Yes, yes. Um, and he's very preoccupied about length. I love that. It was terribly exciting to me. I mean, I've always been very interested in the theatre anyway, though I haven't written about it before. Um, and, uh, and I love that sense that every single time the play happens, something different, something different takes place. And, uh, and that was part of the excitement of trying to capture this and it, you know down to the question of which text do you use when you're quoting the plays in the biography mm. you know do you use one that he's revised or do you use the earlier version I mean there are all kinds of little logistical questions that come up but in the end you're left with this rather wonderful feeling which I think paradoxically is summed up in a film of his not a play which is in love um, where the producer is constantly being asked people with their hands in their hair going what's going to happen will it be all right how are we going to manage is it, how, is, how does it all work out on the night to which he replies it's a mystery <laughs> and we've talked um about him uh very affectionately i'm a great admirer of his work you have written um a broadly sympathetic book on the other hand though um there is a fear as you well know, which you've written about the autobiography, there's a fear among biographers they're going to find something so terrible it will put them off the subject. And that has happened to people. It's the subject of some fine fiction, including, as we sadly have to say, the late Alison Leary now, but the late Alison Leary is the truth about Lauren Jones is about that yeah. issue. With this, um, quite a few people I know in theatre and the literary world at the beginning were saying the opposite. They were saying, poor Hermione, he's so nice. Everyone likes him. He's so charming. She's not going to be able to find out anything at all. Now, you haven't found out anything shocking, but I was struck um, because he is charming and he is has fantastic manners. But what you found, which struck me, was a, a steeliness, an iciness mm. almost, that the work comes first. Mm. Very attentive father, um, loving father, but if anything gets in the way of the work, it gets out of the way. I'm glad I'm I'm glad you said that because some some of some some of the people reading the book have I think can't quite believe that that he's as decent a person as he evidently is. You know, this is a decent, loyal generous, good friend, nice to work with. He doesn't scream at people. You know, he doesn't throw fits. He doesn't throw things at people. I'm thinking of other playwrights we could name. Um, uh, he doesn't do that. Uh, but when, when he wants it to be right and when he thinks it isn't going right, uh, he's, yeah, he's very steely and strong, I think. And you have to be, as you know, in, in that world. It's also very, I was noticed this most of all in the letters that he wrote to film people. Um, getting involved with the film world, as we all know, um, the idea that any good film is ever made is sometimes astonishing to me, given the, you know, the, the money men and the production hazards and the casting problems and everything that comes in the way. And there were many, many times when he had to fight his corner. I mean, with, for instance, with Parade's End, which I think is a marvellous, marvellous adaptation of, of Ford's novel, a really great piece of work. And he, you can see him in the, in the archive, absolutely fighting his corner to not oversimplify, to not put big labels up explaining what's happening all the time, uh, to keep it to a degree subtle and sinuous and complex and rich and not have everything spelt out. And you can see him getting pretty cross, actually. There's also a story <laughs> that I, I greatly like. It shows what he's up against, um, and all film writers are, and TV writers. He writes a fairly obscure work called Squaring the Circle, which mm. was um, about... That's a terrible time. Yeah, solidarity and the revolution uh, in Poland. But there's a moment where he sends a script to a friend who says... Well, I didn't think much of it, but I loved that scene. And he realizes that he didn't write the scene. Yes. <laughs> so the script yes. just as happens in movies, the script. But the other, the other thing about squaring the circle, which is very interesting, is that what he wanted to do was to put into the, the screenplay um, an ambiguous, undecided narrator, a kind of Tom Stoppard doesn't know figure, someone who couldn't actually make his mind up about the rival claims of the regime and of the solidarity movement and of what was going to happen to Poland as a result. And the, the, 
the people, the producers, the the funders, absolutely hated this this character. Uh, and you find it sort of vestigially still in the play, but he clearly had a big battle with that. And that's a very good example where ambiguity works better on the stage than it does on film very often. One of the, um, <laughs> we're just about to open it up to the questions. Okay. We've got a good, um, sub, uh, a good selection here. Um, one of the reasons I may be unusual in this, but I, in literary biographies, I'm always fascinated in the works they didn't write for some reason, that they started and then, um, abandoned, and I think we we all are. But um, there are some very interesting examples here. Uh, one is that there was the very beginning of a play, stage play before Leopoldstadt, which was about artificial intelligence. Yes. Now you say in the book, and it's even stranger now. You say it's a good thing he abandoned it because so many people were writing about artificial intelligence. Ian McEwan was. There was a movie. Um, now, Kazuo Ishiguro, the Nobel laureate, his next, the novel that comes out in March, is about artificial intelligence. But that's one. Then there's a screenplay about presidential bodyguards. Yes. So it is, um, yeah. again, but Mark, I, I don't think Daniel Beckett would have written that, actually. But, but there isn't much. He, As he quite often says, you know, I don't really have a lot in my bottom drawer. I mean, he's not actually a writer who has 10 unfinished masterpieces stashed away. It's, I've, although you're quite right that there are some interesting examples, I found it r rather unusual in his working life that he should have abandoned something. He tends, he tends to feel I've started so I'll finish. Although as a screenplay writer, you're bound to have several. And well, the people who saw the um, bizarre uh, version of Cats, the musical. He even he wrote a script of that. He about. did. That didn't come off, and that's rather fun actually. Um, uh, it's full of bits of T.S. Eliot that that weren't in the original, <laughs> because you know he has a passion for Eliot, and it goes all the way through his his writing life. And it was terribly nice to see him having fun with that. But alas, it never got made. No, and the other very weird one got made much later. Uh, well, we've got some questions, so. Um... Oh, this is like an exam. I might give my answer and then see. Um... Oh, no, I think you should let me give my answer oh, first you, okay, in case no, I get I'll... it wrong. Okay. okay. Um, this is from Paul Douglas, who says, really enjoying the event. Who are Tom Stoppard's main influences? Main influences. In, in influences, without an R. The influencers with the R are the people who are in Dubai. Well, I'll that. tell you a very interesting single answer to that. We've already talked a bit about James Saunders. We talked a little bit about Beckett, who is clearly in there. I've just mentioned Elliot. But the person that I, this came as a surprise to me. I didn't know this until I started the work. He is an enormous fan of Hemingway. Uh, and he has collected Hemingway. And he used to go to Hemingway conferences. Uh, and he's written pieces about Hemingway. And when he was a very young journalist at Bristol, he used to like to do Hemingway spoofs um, and, and parodies. And he is, it's interesting, I think, because one of the things he loves about Hemingway is a, is a very strong sense of a kind of moral, moral point of view in the writing. I'm not talking about the, the human being, Hemingway, um, which is all the time held back. So I think one of the things he really likes about that American writer is that held back quality. Now, that might seem a rather strange thing for me to say about a writer who is so incredibly fluent and energetic and voluble and never at a loss for words. But it's it's got an affinity, I think, when you think about the sorts what we've been talking about, which is that. The slight disguise, the slight sort of restraining himself from, he's not a writer like oh, John Osborne or, or David Hare, actually, who sort of pours his own feelings out onto the stage. He doesn't do that. And I think that holding back in Hemingway is something that he was terribly interested in from very young. So there's my example. What's your... No, that, that, no, 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 I, I'm fascinated by that, that you have um, his... Uh near contemporary Harold Pinter, um, who was uh, influenced very strongly by Beckett, but also by Hemingway, because Stoppard's play that I think he weren't allowed to be published or performed, The Gamblers, which is that little one, and um, 
Pinter's The Dumb Waiter, the early play, are both heavily influenced by Hemingway's The Killers, I think, aren't they? That short story. Yes, I think that's right. And and I think that that may be one of the few examples where there is a kind of Pinterish feeling in in Stoppard, because I think they're very different kinds of playwrights. Interestingly, that they got on very well. Uh, Stoppard enormously admires Pinter. Stoppard is a modest human being, actually, to a degree. Uh, and he will say of Pinter that he thinks he completely changed the landscape, completely changed what theatre can do. And he doesn't feel that he's done that. I think other people would argue that he has, but he clearly feels that Pinter is the um, is 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 the genius there. And Pinter became, in effect, less Jewish as a writer, and Tom Stoppard became more Jewish. As I, don't, I couldn't. I wouldn't want to say that. That's too much of an epigram for me. I can't. I, I'm. <laughs> I'm not going to follow you there. <laughs> um, and then Paul also asks, with a second bite, um, what is Hermione's favourite Stoppard play? Mm, I'm, it depends which one I'm reading or seeing, but I, I, have a, I have a deep fondness for the invention of love. I know that that's a rather odd choice. Um, I, I, the play about Hausman, the, the old Hausman meeting the young Hausman, um, and this painful and poignant m- meeting of the classical scholar and the poet. Um, and I'm I'm very moved by the way in which Hausman is always trying to get back from the land of the dead to the land of the living. But as Karen, the ferryman, says to him, it can't be done, so it can't be done. It's a deeply touching and, and moving play. And I think it's got a lot of Stoppard's own feelings in it. And he did like it very much. And then, of course, Arcadia and, of course, Leopoldstadt. Um, uh, and I'm also very fond of Indian ink. But I thought I was very glad you mentioned Professional Foul earlier on, which I think is one of the great radio, one of the great television TV plays. Yeah, of all time. Well, I think we've affected. Monica Kendall has asked us: Is there a particular production that you both remember that stands out? Uh, Monica says, "I can still see Rosen Crans and Guildenstern with John Stride and Edward mm-hmm. Petherbridge tossing oh. poems with Hamlet dashing around yes. in the background." Uh, yes. Monica says, I was about 15, that's 50 years ago. Yes, it is 50. Well, it's now slightly more, yes. I suppose John Wood as Henry Carr is one of the things that stays in my mind as a really astonishing uh, performance. Um, yeah, there are many. What about you? Well, I, 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 think, um, I, uh, I think you can find professional foul in certain places. So. Yeah. I urge people to watch that. I think the the radio play, The Dog It Was That Died, um, mm. I have a great uh, affection mm. for. Um, mm. Because the thing we talked about earlier, <clears throat> about the combination of high intelligence and, I'm not going to say low because I think that's wrong, but of popular humour, yeah. um, that is so strongly, <clears throat> excuse me, that's so strongly in that play, um, The Dog It Was That Died radio play inferior TV version later, but um, you get uh, Morecambe and Wise carry-on style puns, but you also get a real, again, there, there's a deep, serious heart to that play. I think what you get in... If you're a, a, yes. a double agent, which one are you? Uh, and, of course, that recurs in in, in Hapgood. You, you know, you confuse yourself by being a double agent because you can't remember which side you're on. But I think also what you get in these comedies that we've been talking about... And, on, and indeed in Professional Foul and, and, and other plays too, is a very strong sense of what Englishness is. And it may be that he's able to do that because he's not English. Um, he has, he's completely part of the English establishment and part of the English theatre world. And I'm saying English rather than British because I think there is a kind of sort of old fashioned feeling of Englishness about this. What, you know, when we used to talk about English eccentricity and the quirks of English behavior and the sort of oddities of the way, um, you know, historically English people have been thought to behave by other nations. And I think that's part of his comedy actually. Yeah, it's a, it's a subject for another discussion by the Royal um, Society of Literature, but I think English, yes. I mean, John Le Carre again, Awfully, we have to say the late John Le Carre now, um, who worked with Tom Stoppard and they were friends. Um, but yeah, he's an English writer. He's not a British writer. And I, th- I think these distinctions, in the way that some writers are Scottish or Welsh, I, I, it's hard to know what a British writer would be. I had a wonderful conversation with David Cornwell, um, alias John Le Carre, about Stoppard. Um, it was one of 
most interesting for me one of the most interesting interviews that, that i that i had and david cornwall proposed to me that they that he and stoppard had a deep similarity which they had never talked about uh, which was that they had both been rather unhappy at their English public schools. I think Le Carre rather exaggerated Stoppard's unhappiness, um, that they both lost fathers um, for different reasons, and that there was a kind of darkness part of the way they saw the world, which was not made apparent. It was a sort of secret feeling and that he, he David Cornwall, was aware of in, in Tom Stoppard's character. It's one of the things that drew him drew them together. That was Cornwall's analysis of this. Stoppard read that passage in the book and, did, and made no comment. So, But, but also, which may be a certain type of English speech, uh, English upper-class speech, I mean, they both, as writers, have had great fun with that. They've had fun with it, yes. They're not identified with it at all. No, no absolutely, no, no, but I mean, as an outsider, hearing the ear for that kind yeah. of speech. Um, now, this is from Victoria, who says, I'm loving this, but I'm curious. Dame Hermione, are you friends with Sir Tom after seven years of writing? Being a biographer is such a strange relationship. Do you always stay at arm's length? I'm sure you are invited to the gorgeous parties, although I think the ones in the physic garden have stopped. Well, there was one quite recently, which you were rumoured to be at. Um, but I'm sure he and his wife are still hosting fantastically. Just wondering, now the dust has settled and this splendid book is out, um, do you know him better than anyone or is it a cool professional relationship? That's a good question and a proper question. Um, I knew him rather slightly uh, before he uh, asked me to embark on this and I think that may have been one of the reasons he asked me to do it. I, um because we weren't friends, um, we, we were acquaintances. Um, uh, and of course, I have got to know him quite well through talking to him about his life, but it's only for the job, as it were. I mean, I think that he will always be generous and friendly um, to me for as long as we live. Um, I can't imagine uh, falling out with him over anything. Um, nor can I imagine spending enormous amounts of time with him again, because this was, you know, the time I spent with him was to do with the professional uh, job of, of, you know, both of us um, carrying out our commitments to this job. Um, and I'm very relieved and glad that um, there haven't been uh, horrible fallings out uh, along the way. And I know many stories about uh, biographers who have tried to work um, on living subjects or who have tangled with the relations of recently dead subjects and it's it's very difficult it's one of those very difficult situations but ultimately yeah there is a kind of um, pragmatic professionalism about a biographer's relationship to their subject whether that subject be dead or alive. That is a question from Vanessa McMahon which is effectively about whether your job is yet done on Sir Tom. She says, is Tom Stoppard working on another play or has he, did he accept the biography as he had decided to stop writing? No, uh, quite the opposite. I thought that I was finished when I got to his 80th birthday and that was actually where I was going to stop. And then um, he started to write a major play, which was, you know, Really exciting, but I must say I did wipe my brow at that moment. I thought, oh, I've got to write another chapter now. Um, yes, which that, would, that would have been course. 2017, presumably. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And um, then it falls back exactly. up, which is yeah. we should say this. It's very, very rare. If you think of the fragments that Beckett and Pinter and others were writing later in life, um, it's very, very rare for a playwright to write a major play uh, past the age of 80. Yes, that's an interesting point. Whether there is more to come, I have no idea. I really hope there will be. And then we're almost done here. Um, I think, oh yes, Ross Settles says, assuming Stoppard is in the Premier League, and then perhaps unfairly doubting your knowledge of football says that means 20 um, of modern playwrights, where would you place him in the league? 
and why? I suppose it's whether you do living this is or... The sort of, this is the sort of question that he would really hate. And although I am not trying to speak on his behalf, because I don't have the right to do that, uh, when you began this enterprise tonight, you said we can probably call him the greatest living playwright. It's the kind of phrase that he absolutely abhors. He finds it embarrassing. He doesn't want to accept that title. And he thinks, and here's my answer, it's too soon to tell. Uh, well, it, it was him and Pinter for a while, and then Carol Churchill is in there now. But it's a small, it's a small number of candidates, if that title were to be bestowed, which you have sternly suggested, um, it, it should not be. Uh, so, um, yes, we're coming up to eight thirty. So, um, I think uh, I'm going to hand back now to Molly Rosenberg, who is the um, chair of the Royal Literary. Before Society. you go, Mark, thank you very much. I've had well, thank great you, fun. Finally, and I'm going to just give you, which is what all authors are in it for, really, a plug, <laughs> which is this is Hermione's extraordinary biography of Tom Stoppard. Um, do read it. Thank you. Thank you. Molly. Thank you so much, Hermione and Mark. Uh, and I'm sure uh, after hearing that and seeing the very book itself, you'll be eager to buy it, Tom Stoppard, A Life, if you haven't already. Uh, you can do that at the top of your screen through the British Library's online bookshop. If you want to come to events like these for free, and let's be honest, why wouldn't you? Please join the Royal Society of Literature. Our membership starts at 40 pounds a year and gives you free access to all of the RSL's events, our publications and our book groups, which are now online. Our next event is on the 4th of March uh, in another collaboration with the British Library and this time with Leeds Lit Fest as well. We'll be welcoming Andrea Levy's friends and family for a conversation led by journalist Gary Young uh, on what would have been her 65th birthday. Joining Gary will be Melanie Abrahams, Kwame Dawes, Bill Mablin, Ella Mesmer and Michael Perfect. The day before that, uh, you can also come to the RSL Online Book Club. I'll be co-hosting with Dr. Emily Zobel Marshall and we'll be discussing Andrea Levy's Small Island in preparation for the event. So please join us for that. Members and fellows of the RSL can book through our website and for public tickets, which are free for both of those, you can go through the British Library. Uh, a big thank you from me this evening to everyone at the British Library, uh, to my colleagues at the RSL, particularly our events manager, Beth Gallimore, and our producers, Unique Media, for making tonight possible, and to all of you for joining us. Until next time, a final massive thank you to Mark and to Hermione, and good night to you all.